Hey everyone, welcome to the National Quilter Circle live event for February. I'm Nikki LaFoyle filling in for Ashley today and I'd like to welcome Colleen Talkey. Thank you for being with us again tonight, Colleen. Thanks for having me. Now, Colleen, um, you just got back from a craft tours trip with National Quilter mm -hmm. Circle to Bali. So I'm super excited to hear about what you did on your trip and what kind of quilting you did, what fabrics you learned about. So tell us a little bit about that. Oh, the craft tours adventure with the Bali group was amazing. Um, it's interesting that when you travel with quilters, um, you expand your quilt family so much. Mm -hmm. Now my quilt family reaches all the way to Syracuse, New York, to West Virginia, Texas, up into Canada, and all over California. <laughs> so um, getting to know all these women while we were traveling was amazing. Um, we left out of LAX. Um, the travel to Bali went through Taipei. So we kind of had a long time on airports in, in airplanes to get to start chatting. Um, uh, where are you from? What are things you like to do? Um, once we got there, the the agenda was, was amazing. Deb um, uh, was our craft tours person. Mm -hmm. uh, all these things have been set up so that you just kind of float from one activity to the next each day. Um, you have enough downtime to enjoy the scenery, the food, which was really great, and even some shopping along the way. So um, I'm not sure where you want to start, but um, my three highlights, maybe I should just pick three, three things that were the most amazing adventures. Um, probably the top one was that even my daughter was impressed that I rode on an elephant. <laughs> nice. We got to go to an elephant um, preserve um, and where they told us all about the history of they brought these elephants in as kind of a reserve area for them um, and all the work that people had done to preserve the elephant population that was brought in and then um, how the handlers, each handler has an elephant that they train with and they stay with just that one. And um, we got to ride through the preserve area and why they were telling us about that. Um, even one of the quilters even went as far as to swim with the elephant, actually ride on the front, go down into the water and um, then come back up and, and get a hug from the elephant at the end uh -huh. of the ride. So it was pretty it's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Quite, um, um, Brave, I think it's what yeah. <laughs> said. Um, so the elephant was, uh, park was really amazing. Um, the fun part for me, of course, as an instructor, was to get to teach a class mm -hmm. in the most tropical place I've ever been on the planet. Um, my classroom only had two walls. The other oh. two walls were the outdoors. <laughs> oh, so we had palm trees and birds and everything in the background, even a little thunder shower that moved in on us. But um, we were um, grouped in, I grouped them in fours because most people were traveling with someone they someone that they knew. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of created an environment so they got to know two other quilters sitting at the table. And we did um, Cathedral Window, which you can see over my shoulder, oops, on the other side there. Um, the table runner I did in big version, but they did um, a pin cushion. So it was all done by hand in a very traditional method, which is the same way that both of my grandmothers made quilts. Mm -hmm. So, but they only had to make two blocks. <laughs> my grandmothers made twin bed-sized quilts. Mm -hmm. so they learned a little history of the uh, cathedral window block, um, how it came about when it first was identified in the 1930s, and then actually got to make uh, um, a pincushion worth of the cathedral window. Um, it was kind of a challenge because it was something that most of them hadn't done before. I even had one gal who'd never even sewn before at all. She was wow. traveling with her mother-in-law, I believe it is. And um, she was like, how do I make a knot? So we, got <laughs> some, we had some really great times experiencing something new. And, you know, as quilters, 
I had a group of uh, probably 23 or 24 of them that came to class to learn it. Um, you know, we we jump in and we help each other. Those who are more experienced, of course, then jump in and help those who are inexperienced or I'm stuck on this before I could even get there. They were helping each other out. The generosity of quilters is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so Wonderful. They, they really had fun doing the cathedral window. Um, the highlight of our trip, though, was the Batik factory. Um, uh -huh. We drove into this little area. We had to go. Um, most of the time we toured by bus and that would take us in and drop us off. But the area where the boutique factory was, the streets are so narrow that we had to go by vans. So we had to split up into vans to even get into this area. And then um, when we got there, they had it all set up so that the, the gentleman who runs the factory, her own, the owner, gave a presentation, told us about the boutiques and the things that they produced there. And then we got to make our own pieces of batik, three different styles, wow. not one piece, but three different styles. So we got to dye a piece of fabric, which you can see over my shoulder. Like I think here on this side, there's one with purple blotches, kind of purple blotches. My coloring wasn't the best. Um, so it was just two color, two tone there. Then there is one that, has, that looks like it has a pink flower kind of in the center of it behind me. That one was a wax relief. They did the wax outline for us. And then we got to select one that was on a frame and we got to paint in the areas. And then they finished it with the drying process and the washing away of the wax. Wow. The, my favorite though. And there were some amazing ones. So you'll have to follow us on Facebook because it's some of the pictures of people's boutiques are going to show up. Um, the final one is right over my shoulder, and that one is a turquoise, but up close, it is stamped with wax. So we each got to go into an area to pick out the stamps. They have hundreds of stamps of different designs. Because if you walk into a fabric shop in the boutique section, you see a huge variety of um, styles of stamps on things. Sometimes it's floral, sometimes there are leaves. And those then are, you dip the, the stamp into the wax. An assistant from the factory showed us how to stamp it so we would do it properly. And, and then when we got one row done, then we went to do the second and he would say, no, no. And he would move our hand to make sure the registration. Because if you look at a, a yardage of the tea, the stamps are always continuous, like it's been rolled. And actually stamped with blocks that are in perfect registration to each other. I don't know how they do it. They're amazingly accurate when they're working. Yeah. We each got to make a stamped piece and then watch, watch as they do the, the washing and the boiling to take away the wax. So we huh. didn't really know what our designs are going to look like because they delivered them to the hotel the next day. Okay. Because the process takes another three or four hours between the drying process, the boiling process, and the setting process, we are all like, we aren't gonna see her all day, are we? <laughs> like, no, I'll bring them to you. <laughs> so it was, we had marked all of our fabrics with our name in the corner. And so when they delivered them, you would have thought it was Christmas day. We all <laughs> gathered around the table at breakfast. We all wanted to find our pieces. And some were so surprised, I was like, it turned out way better than I thought it would <laughs> for well, all that, the cookies. <laughs> yeah, that sounds incredible. The whole experience sounds incredible. And I love what you said about quilters helping each other out. And you had a, a lady who had never sewn before. So these, these awesome trips that um, National Quilter Circle, and I'm actually going on one for National Sewing Circle in September. We're going to Ireland. Um, so it's, it's, very inclusive. You don't have to be a lifelong sewer to go on these trips. You can go to learn and explore and enjoy not only where you're going, but enjoy the group you're going with. And like you said, create a community and, you know, lifelong friends possibly too. So I love that. And um, the batiks sounds so cool to be able to get your hands on those and see the process and how it's made. Um, so if you are going to be quilting with a batik, um, 
you know, how is it different to use a batik rather than like a quilting cotton? Do you have to treat it differently, wash it differently beforehand? There, there are some things to, to take into consideration. If it's an extremely vivid color, like a hot pink or a red or a deep purple, some will suggest at least rinse it in cold water to make sure there isn't um, any loose dyes. Usually though, if they come from a quilt shop quality, you usually don't have too much of a problem of inks leaching out of it, mm -hmm. but sometimes quilters feel just more comfortable knowing ahead yeah. of time there's no loose ink in there. So they'll right. take and dip it into cold water and, and just to test it for that. Um, the other thing about batiks is because there's so much ink applied and it goes all the way through the fiber, there isn't a right or a wrong side. Okay. So it makes it really fun when you're piecing, you don't have to worry about right or wrong side. Unless of course you're linking your pieces together for binding. Yes, <laughs> you know, the idea of there's a right and wrong side and your seam allowances are going to show, you do have to keep track of which side you're using as the right, right. side. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, cool. So um, do you have any other points about the trip that you wanted to bring up before we get into some questions people have sent in? Um, the, the last part, of course, mm -hmm. which was the other highlight. I mean, there were so many other things that we did. Um, but for most quilters, the highlight was after we got to make our batiks, we actually got to shop for batiks. Oh, nice. <laughs> so we got to go into this big room of bolts of fabric and shop for fabric by the meter. So we had to remember it's going to be a little bit more than a yard, mm -hmm. but it prices that were really, really low, like nice. about a quarter of what it costs here in the States. Wow. So were you able to fit it all in your suitcase? <laughs> That's a question. I got mine in my suitcase, but I had some friends who had to buy suitcases. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, we actually, um, the, the craft tours person has an inexpensive suitcase that you can acquire at a resort <laughs> because there was no way they were going to get it in their suitcase. Yeah. So, yeah. There, there was some extreme shopping going on. In nice. fact, there were a few ladies that took, um, when we had free time one afternoon, took off and went on an adventure and bought more fabric. So that's we have some questions here. So we had some questions sent in. First one is about, um, about basting. So is it a based, a large quilt? So how would you, what's your favorite way of basting a quilt and when a quilt gets really large? Does it change the way you want to baste it? Okay. When it comes to basting a quilt, I tend to go with spray based. Mm -hmm. um, you can hand baste or pin baste. Uh, and I've done that. But for me, it seems that every time I pin baste a quilt, and then I go to actually put it in the machine and start quilting, I put the pins right where I want to sew. Yeah. <laughs> means moving them all. So mm -hmm. spray basting for me has always been um, kind of my go-to and I usually would spray base up to like a throw size quilt, maybe a twin size quilt. Um, making sure that I start in the middle of the quilt and work my way to the outer edge in each direction, kind of like putting contact paper down or shelf paper down, right? You know, kind of roll the, the sides in and start in the middle and work your way, smoothing it out and then flip the quilt over and do the back side same way. And since it's a spray base can be adjusted, it's not a permanent adhesion. So if you do get a wrinkle or something happens, you can, you may need an extra set of hands. So you may call on your neighbor or your, your quilting friend to come and help you, but you can pull back and then smooth again. And sometimes it does take kind of a second hand unless you take it to the floor to pull back and then adjust to make sure you get all of the wrinkles out and um, get that centered properly. But um, spray based is my favorite one. Um, mm -hmm. There are different spray based products out there. Try the try the different ones and see which is your favorite. Everyone has a favorite. Um, there are at least three or four different brands of spray based out there. So mm -hmm. Pick one that works best for you. Right. Okay. And so with that spray-based, it is a light adhesive. So do you find 
does that gum up your needle at all as your needles going through your layers and that? Mm -hmm. No, um, the spray base tends to not have any issue with the needle. It's designed for quilters. And mm -hmm. so it adheres just a very light layer of the batting to the back of your fabric. And it's not, um, it doesn't clump. It's very, very thin. So the needle has no problem going through it. So, okay. Okay, good. It's clean. Good. And so I'm probably going to ask some very beginner questions as I'm asking follow up questions because I've, I have a sewing background. So I do the, um, you know, the Q and A's for the sister site national sewing circle. And I've been adjacent to quilting for my whole sewing career, but never actually quilting. Um, so as we're talking about needles and uh, fabrics and things like that, do you find, um, certain fabrics dull your needle quicker than others mm. or how often do you have to change your needle when you're quilting that's a really good question because um batiks probably because the what the base fabric is a very tight weave mm. um, it can dull the the tip of the needle a little bit quicker than um conventionally printed fabrics. So that can be um, an issue there. Um, when you're working with batiks though, and you're gonna be quilting those, sometimes people say, I wanna use a really fine needle. But the problem is with a really fine needle, that means then the groove that the fab or the thread rides in is also small. So you, mm -hmm. you may have skip stitches. So if you experience that, you may have to go up a size in the needle in order to give that thread enough room to be carried down through the layers and back up without um, too much friction again mm -hmm. the needle because that friction will pull on I will also tug on the thread and cause skip stitches so experiment there if you have some issues and skipping um, you know go up a size in the needle that you're you're working with okay yeah that's a, a really good tip and one that I'm gonna remember for my sewing too <laughs> Um, and with quilters, we always should change needles. The suggestion is that we change needles with every pro, um, major project that we work on. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we always do that, yeah, not actually happen. But <laughs> when you start to have issues, when you tend to have, tend to have skip, skipping, or if you see that a thread is getting pulled or um, snagged, that's the time to get a need a new needle in your machine. Probably. Yep. Yeah, good. And it is hard to remember to change your needle out after every project. Ashley and I talk about this all the time. She usually just waits until problems start and then it's like, oh, wait, when was the last time you did that? Yeah. That was a problem. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, try, try to just keep track of that, you know, as, as good as you can. Um, so also in terms of working with batik fabrics. So since there's such a wide range of vibrant colors that batiks can come in, do you find you have to maybe change the ruler that you're using in terms of being able to see the markings on your ruler? Um, I, I haven't, but I think most of us find rulers that we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, there are rulers that have a bright yellow or a, um, almost an iridescent yellow. Some For some people's vision, that yellow is too much reflection and it's hard to see. Um, if you go to a ruler that's more black and white, you tend to have a pretty good um, line there. If your batiks are really dark, you're going to have to find ones that maybe even have a white line on them. So yeah, mm -hmm. there, there can be times when you may have to adjust rulers. So mm -hmm. That just means we have to have an assortment of rulers yeah. that are ready <laughs> for for the time that you know we need to you know adjust it. Same thing happens with marking tools. Mm -hmm. You know, find a perfect marking tool that works on light fabric, but then what happens to when you get to a navy blue or a dark green, and then that you know pencil or lead a gray lead doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. you find a, you know another tool that well maybe has um, a light ceramic lead that shows up on dark. So there's always a reason to buy a new tool. <laughs> to go check out your, you know, favorite uh, quilt shop to see what's in stock, what's new, or mm -hmm. or go to that um, quilt show 
and see what the vendors are offering and see what their demos are. So yeah, a, a, a ruler and a marking pencil for every color of fabric that <laughs> yep. you could get. I know I have a couple of rulers in my sewing room, but that's usually because I forget where I put one. And so I have a couple stashed around the room. <laughs> but exactly. yeah, always a good reason to buy some more supplies. Of course. Um, so we have another question here. How do you properly cut corners? So do you have any tips for cutting good, clean corners? Um, if it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if they mean by cutting corners when they're squaring up their quilt, that is sometimes an issue. When quilters mm -hmm. get done with a quilt and they want to square the outer edges of their quilt, um, usually using a large square ruler so that you have the most, um, most edge possible, but it really is to look at the diagrams, um, see what the suggestions in the in the pattern that you're working on um, suggests on how to cut that. Make sure you're looking for leaving a quarter inch seam allowance on the outside edge, especially right. if you piece an outer border. You don't want to cut off your seam allowance mm -hmm. in the process of squaring it. So um, if you don't have a large a 12 and a half or a 14 and a half square ruler, you can put two rulers together. So say you have a eight by 14 ruler and maybe um, a six by 12. You can put them together, abut them, tape them together so that you create a nice long corner. So right. that you can line up and create a squaring effect there. Sometimes when you're working on a quilt and you've got it a little skewed, when you go to put that ruler on there to make that cut at first is really scary because you're thinking, am I straight? Well, mm -hmm. the solution is to take out your either a chalk line um, marking tool or a marking pencil. Mark it in pencil first. If you're going to be cutting away some pieces and you're afraid you might not be square when you get to the other end of your quilt, mm -hmm. mark it first. See if it's square. <laughs> yes. Because that way you can do a measure across the quilt in the middle and both directions to see if it is going to end up square before you cut those edges off. Yes. It's, it's kind of one of those, you know, once you cut it off, you can't put it back on. Absolutely. That is scary. So <laughs> yeah, measure twice at once. Yes. But <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. And literally counting. I mean, I still do it. When I go to, to cut even a strip, I'll cut. You know, I'm going to do a two and a half inch strip and I'm cutting one, I'm counting one, two and a half. Mm -hmm. so that I make sure I'm in the right place before I make that slice. Yep. It's very easy to wrap up the ruler if it's one that has full inches on one side and starts with a half inch on the other. It's very easy to invert that. So, yep, absolutely. Talk to yourself. It's okay. Yep. Good tip. <laughs> the cat won't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great. So uh, another question here. Um, I'm I'm thinking of entering my quilt into a county fair this year. What oh. should I expect? So have you ever entered anything into a fair? Yes, I have. <laughs> my first boss um, challenged me to enter um, some quilts at the Iowa State Fair. Well, I challenged her back so that I wouldn't be the only one because <laughs> I was a 4-H'er years and years ago, and so I've experienced county fairs and state fairs at the 4-H level, but never in an open class mm -hmm. and competing with quilters from all over the state who are amazing. Um, when you enter it into a, a county fair, it may be a little bit different than the state fair level. Um, make sure that you, you hit all their deadlines for entering it because they don't usually waive the dates on those. Make sure that you put the place the tag in the area that they have told you to, or they'll make you move it. <laughs> um, don't some some county fairs may give you some feedback afterwards, um, but in in the state fair here, you might get two or three words, and that would be it. There are so many quilts entered that they will go through and score your overall design your construction, maybe your binding or your color choice, maybe on a scale from one to five, maybe. So they'll score it there. Um, you might get a couple of words and you know, nice job on binding corners or something. Mm -hmm. But if it's a large competition, 
there might not be very much feedback. So just be prepared that you may not get a lot of feedback. Um, when you enter something at a county fair or a state fair, you're really there to share, share your artwork with anybody and everyone who's walking through the fair. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, at the state fair level, they only give a, like three, uh, four placings, I think. It's first through fourth. And then there's an honorable, a couple of layers of honorable mention. So maybe only five ribbons in one category where there might be 50 quilts entered or more. So the competition is kind of steep. Right. County fairs may not be that way. I don't know for sure how all county fairs run. Um, they may only give out three placings for second and third. So do it as um, a way to share your artwork. Don't worry too much about the competition. And, and sometimes people say, well, I don't want somebody to judge my artwork. When I walk through the county fair and the state fair and look at the quilts, I'm not judging anything. I'm just totally soaking in the artwork. Just appreciating it all. Yes. Yeah. Everyone has a different approach to, um, say, a memory quilt or a baby quilt mm -hmm. or even a quilt of valor, possibly. And I love to see what people come up with. And it's, like, it's inspirational. You want to go home then and try out that version because we don't always have enough time to do all the quilts we think of. Yeah. It's nice to see what someone else has been doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great way to feel, you know, like you're a part of the community and also the quilting community at exactly. large. So yeah, that, I think it's a, a great idea. It's a fun thing to enter your work in things like that. And it might be a great way to inspire someone else to jump in. They, they may fall in love with what you've done and see your name on it and ask you questions. You might inspire the next great quilter. Yeah, awesome. So speaking of that, for someone who is not an experienced quilter like myself, who maybe wants to get into quilting, but is kind of maybe intimidated by the scale of the projects, what advice would you have for someone getting into quilting? Well, that's interesting because just last evening, at the end of the day, I was at work at the quilt shop that I work at here in Ames, and I was assisting a quilter who's actually a brand new quilter who was just taking a beginner's class. Mm -hmm. And she was selecting her fabrics and kind of unsure of, is this going to work together? Go to a local quilt shop. They're there to assist you. Um, they, you know, if if the direction that the, the fabric selection isn't going the direction you want, you can step back and start again. But by taking a class, this gal was taking a class with her sister-in-law. So finding a buddy to start with is kind of nice because that way you have somebody to feel like we're in this together. <laughs> and I did that. I took a class with a gal who wanted to learn. And Michelle and I started at the same time and she's now this fancy long armor. Um, but sometimes quilting with a friend like that is a, is a great way to get started. Take a class to learn the basics because there's a lot of things like simply how to use a rotary cutter, um, how to thread the machine and create a quarter inch seam allowance and how to properly press your seams. Those things will give you so much confidence that then you feel like I have the tools I need to keep going and that will inspire you. And you get to, you get to meet a bunch of people in class too. They, they will inspire you too. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's, it's always fun to do things in a class environment just for the sake of, you know, bouncing ideas off of each other and yeah, the community of that. Great. Um, so I have another question here. We were talking about rulers. Um, do you have a ruler brand preference? Do you have a favorite um, brand or size of ruler for quilting? Mm -hmm. um, I actually have two brands that I really like. I like Creative Grids because of the variety of, of um, specialty rulers that they have. And they have built-in grips to the back. They're black and white markings. It's easy and crisp to read. Um, I've really enjoyed working with those. Recently, well, when, I, when I started working in the shop here in Ames, um, I was introduced to the um, Quilter Select rulers, and they are um, 
more of a, a line at this point that square and rectangular shapes. So not specialty rulers per se, but the nice part about theirs is that the back has a coating that is not really tacky, but it's it's got a frosted like back. And when it lays down on fabric, it doesn't slide. In fact, when I first started working and I picked one up, I'm like, why doesn't the ruler move? <laughs> and to even adjust it, I had to put my fingernail kind of under the corner and to lift. Mm -hmm. And come to the fact that that as we get older, it's harder and harder to hold our rulers to go all the way across the width of fabric. And sometimes even for beginners, even for younger quilters, getting used to how to hold that ruler that's in a safe me method, so our fingers are out of the way, and be able to make a cut all the way across the fabric, those quilter select rulers are really fabulous for accuracy. Um, they do not shift out of the way. Um, I've had a lot of quilters who have come in and, and they're looking for, I need to replace a ruler, I chipped the corner, or I, I was taken to class and I dropped it in the parking lot and it cracked. And, and they're saying, you know, what do I start with? You know, where do I go? What do, which one should I select? And I'll usually go to the cover or the counter and I'll pull down three different brands and I'll say, try them because you have to like what you're buying. Mm -hmm. So I give them a rotary cutter and I give them a scrap of fabric and they try them. And usually they end up with quilter select. <laughs> now, that's one that they were just like, oh my gosh, I've always had a problem with my ruler walking away mm -hmm. and like, getting to the far end. And as well, this will do it. <laughs> this is the one that you can put into your, your um, stash of rulers and you'll enjoy using. So. Awesome. Yeah. That's 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 the one I've kind of gone to now. So yeah, that's great that it doesn't slide because I have that issue too. When I'm trying to rotary cut all the way along a ruler, mm -hmm. so yeah, I'll be checking that out too. <laughs> um, let's see, we've got a question here. Um, do you have to do both the piecing and quilting in order to enter a quilt in a fair, or can I have someone else quilt it? That's a really good question. I think there are usually two categories at the fair. There is a category for you finished it yourself. And then there's a category for team quilting. Basically you've created the top and someone else has done the quilting. So there are usually two categories, at least at the state fair level, there are two categories <clears throat> that you enter your quilt in, whether you've done all the, the work yourself or if you're giving some credit to a long arm quilter. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, now we were talking about favorite brands of rulers. Do you have a favorite brand of sewing machine? Is one better for quilting than another? Or what features do you look for in a sewing machine that are good for quilting? Oh, that's that's tough because I started, I, I own three different brands of sewing machines. Um, I started years and years ago. My graduation present from high school was a Kenmore sewing machine. And it was a very basic machine. It stitches wonderfully. It's all mechanical. So it's an older machine and it works fine. But it didn't have the um, bells and whistles that I was looking for later. Um, as I got into quilting and away from garment sewing, which I still do some, but not as much, um, mm -hmm. I was looking for three or four basic things. So when I went shopping, I needed a machine where I could have needle adjustment side to side mm -hmm. instead of that needle always in the very center i wanted to be able to scoot it to one side and have a little bit more variation there so needle adjustment side to side then i was looking for a machine that would do um, either what we call the buttonhole stitch or a blanket stitch because i like to do um, machine applique mm -hmm. and that was the way i like to finish my applique is with a buttonhole stitch. So I wanted that because before that I was doing it all by hand, yards and yards and miles and miles of blanket stitch. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing I wanted, but that's a personal preference. And then the last thing was that when I when I did get a, mach, um, a new machine, I wanted to get make sure that I had a walking foot and the darning foot or hopper foot for um, free motion quilting. My old machine came with a plate 
that slid in over the feed dogs at the bottom. So you could glide your fabric to do free motion. And that creates a lot of drag underneath the quilt. So a machine that when you're doing those um, for the free motion and where you could drop the feed dogs with a mm -hmm. lever and disengage them, that was really important to me to have those simple things. They were on my wish list. So when I went shopping, that was what I wanted to see demonstrated. And I wanted to sit down to the machine to see how that felt and how it sounded. Um, I ended up buying, I have a Viking sewing machine. Um, and I've had that one about 15 years. And it's it's still a great machine. My daughter learned on it. And if she has her way, she'll probably run off with that machine <laughs> and have it <laughs> as her major machine. Mm -hmm. um, but then after I worked with Fonz and Porter, Love of Quilting, I was exposed to a whole bunch more brands as we were sitting down to do TV and video there. Um, I absolutely love the baby lock machines. I'm not an embroidery person, but the, the horsepower and the capability and the size of the baby lock machines, whether it's the Alissimo, um, the um, Crescendo, the Destiny, they're all really great machines because they have a lot of um, throat space, easy and really great lighting, a lot of adjustability. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually didn't buy one of those because they're so high on my wish list that the brother machine was one that I ended up with, um, which is very similar in the layout because it's kind of a cousin to the baby lock. Mm -hmm. And I really like the, the brother machine that I have now. So okay. it really comes down to when people have asked me that question in the past, I'm like, go sit down and listen to what it sounds like. Yeah. Like, oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> Just the sound of the machine and how it works and how the buttons are arranged. It has mm -hmm. to be pleasing so that when you sit down, it's enjoyable. Right. So think about yeah. that. Get somebody to demo it. Let you and then have, have you sit down to the machine and, and work at it. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting down and test driving a machine is definitely, I found the best way to really get a feel for a machine before you mm -hmm. make that investment. True. Sure. Um, follow up question on the ruler. Um, you're talking about the ruler with the sticky back. Mm -hmm. If my ruler doesn't have grip on it, like you're mentioning, what can I add to the back of it to create that non-slip feeling? Or can using a ruler handle help me hold it steadier? Ruler handle can can work. It will help you get some um, um, grip on the ruler. There are um, at least one or two products out there and now it's going to escape me the name of it it comes in a, a a can it's a spray on it goes on the back of your ruler it makes it slightly tacky um, similar to the surface that's on um, the back of quilter select it does over time kind of dry out and has to be reapplied so that is a possibility and that i don't think this product's been around for a long time yet it's fairly new on the market i'm just uh, the name of it's escaping me, but if you ask at a local quilt shop or, uh, or, or even Google spray on adhesive or uh, for the back of a ruler, I'm sure it's going to pop up. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just Googled. So I found a product that's called ruler magic. Okay. Maybe there's a couple different ones, but I found one called ruler magic and my, okay. my you search see. term was ruler back tacky spray. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's even another one out there, but there's at least one or two out there that people have enjoyed using too. So if you really like the ruler you have, then maybe you can just add that to the back of it and, and make that ruler even last longer for you. Yeah, great. Give it a try. All right. A uh, couple more questions here before we wrap it up. What do you recommend with respect to quilt labels? Are machine embroidered labels a good option and what info should be on them? Hmm. If you have the option to do a, a machine embroidered or, or even hand embroidered um, labels, that's absolutely really nice to do because they don't fade over time. Um, I've usually inked mine. I think probably most of my quilts are not going to be heirloom quilts, um, <laughs> but at least on the back, I like to um, include who the quilt was given to, the date it was given, if it was given for a special event, and then 
um, my name as the, as the creator of the quilt. And if a lot of really fabulous machine quilting was done, I usually like to try to give credit to the, the long arm quilter too, because her artistry or his artistry is as part of the quilt too. Right. So. Very nice. And there are, I know a bunch of, um, you know, online resources where you can order your own, you know, embroidered labels. Um, the Dutch label shop is one that I think Ashley may have mentioned before um, that you can order, you know, little embroidered labels with exactly what you want on them and just right. sew them on the back. So, and you can even find, um, I think in our area here, there are a couple of people who create custom labels, people who have embroidery machines who will do custom ones for you. So possibly ask in a quilt shop near you, you might be able to um, help out the economy there too, um, yeah. with someone who will do it locally for you. Yes, shopping local is yep. always great. Oh, um, it's always fun to have on the back of quilts. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, all right, one last question. What brother machine do you have? The brother machine I have is called the Anovos QC 1000. Okay. So it's probably been around a while. Um, it happened to be part of a collection of sewing machines that was in the um, Fonz and Porter offices when I was there. And um, the companies had sent the machines to be used for video and um, demo and things, and they weren't going to be returned. So um, there was a little process by which the machines were all kind of um, lotter or lottery dr drawn <laughs> and different people got different machines and this happened to be the one that I got. So nice. it works pretty good. <laughs> very, very cool. Well, Colleen, I could talk to you all night about quilting, but um, we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank you for being here to answer all of our questions. Thank everyone who's watching. And let me just mention real quick at the bottom of this video, there is a banner for downloading a free Irish quilt pattern. It's a fun quilt pattern with shamrocks and interlocking circles. So that's um, a fun pattern, free download to try for St. Patrick's Day next month. So uh, give that banner a click and thanks again and have a good night.